Hi, good evening. I'm Omar Acevedo and I'm the Literary Programs Coordinator here at the Mark Twain House and Museum. Um, and I'm happy to welcome you all to this author talk for Knowing What We Know, The Transmission of Knowledge from Ancient Wisdom to Modern Magic by Simon Winchester. First, I want to thank our sponsors, which include Connecticut Humanities, the Connecticut Department of Economic and Community Development, Answorth Charitable Foundation, Bank of America, the Greater Hartford Arts Council's United Arts Campaign, the Hartford, the Mark Twain Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and Travelers. I also want to uh, take a ch uh, chance to encourage you all to consider to become a member. All members receive free admission to our author programs, the House and Museum, year-round discounts in the store and cafe, and much more. Uh, please let me know if you're interested. Now on to our guests. Simon Winchester is the acclaimed author of many books, including The Professor and the Madman, The Men Who United the States, The Map That Changed the World, The Man Who Loved China, A Crack in the Edge of the World, and Land, all of which were New York Times bestsellers and appeared on numerous best and notable lists. In 2006, Simon was made an officer of the Order of the British Empire, OBE, by the late Queen Elizabeth. Bridget Quinn is the CEO of Hartford Public Library and serves as secretary of the Mark Twain House and Museum's Board of Trustees. Now that I've made the proper introductions, I'll turn this over to Simon and Bridget. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. Well, it's so nice to have you here. Can we have another round of applause to welcome Simon? So I feel very fortunate to be sitting in this seat this evening because I have been a fan of your works for a very long time. And as we briefly discussed, I was going to, you know, kind of launch this as an intro, but I kind of spoiled my lead. But um, about 20 years ago, you were a guest at the Essex Library, and I was the director of the Essex Library at the time. And um, Simon was, you know, right off, it was, and I cannot remember because I'm getting old, whether it was Krakatoa or Map That Changed the World, but, you know, you're a big time author, you know, New York Times bestseller all over the place. And it was, um, you know, a little small town librarian, and I was just a fan of his books, and I remember sending an email and saying, maybe he'll come. And I sent an email, and lo and behold, you came to my tiny little library down in Essex, Connecticut, and it was a packed house, and it was a wonderful thing. So you've always been such a gracious um, author to come and, and talk about your works, and I, uh, I know it was well received, and it's just a really wonderful thing to be here with you this evening. It's a very nice thing to say, a nice thing to remember. That was a good thing. Oops. Ooh, gracious um, me, that's not Oh, good. my goodness. Okay. Get my first page here. So we're here tonight to talk about your wonderful new book, which I really enjoyed reading. Um, but before we start doing that, I, I want to talk a little bit about you because I'm fascinated by your life and the experiences that you've had. And I think maybe we should have the audience have an opportunity to get to know you a little uh, about that as well. And there's so many things that would be great to talk about. I know we need to talk about the book. Um, but so many things in your life, your world travel, driving through the Middle East, which I think is absolutely fascinating, your career shift from geology to journalism, beekeeping, because I'm also a beekeeper. Um, but there's actually one thing that I've been dying to ask you after reading you know, through your biography is, way back when, when you were in boarding school, before you went to university, there was an event. There was a, there was a scandal, uh, well, a scandalous event. I don't know if it was scandalous because I don't have a lot of details, but I'd love to know more about the experiment that went wrong and why you had to leave boarding school before you why went do into people university. Keep bringing this up? I know because it's interesting. <laughs> and well, I, I remember it rather vividly, but I, it, it it sort of resurfaced only about five years ago. As so if someone in Dorset, I went to school in Dorset, said get this fellow, you know, just start talking about that. Well, it was, I, I was head of school. I mean, I was a sort of distinct, I was captain of rugby. I wasn't captain of cricket, but this was summer. So I was playing cricket and about maybe three or four days before the end of term. 
after which I would you know, leave the school forever and go up to university. And um, I was doing, I don't want to get too technical about this, but I was doing A-level in chemistry, physics, and zoology. And we had a new, brand new, an extremely expensive laboratory. Um, and we were playing cricket, and I think I had been bowled out for, I don't know, 20 or 25 or something. And so I had nothing else to do except sort of lie on the grass and admire the rest of the cricket match. But the a chap who, <coughs> I remember his name was Wood. We all went by our surnames, of course, being an English school, so I was interested he was Wood. Um, he knew nothing about science. He was doing his A-levels in something like you know, English literature or French or something. And uh, I said, oh, Wood, you know, we're doing nothing. Um, would you like to come and see the new chemistry lab? And, said, yeah, I'd love to. I have no idea why, but so we went over to this beautiful, pristine building, and with the chemistry was on the third floor, and you know it's all glass bottles and pipettes and distilling. I mean, it all looked fairly impressive. I said, would you like to see an experiment? And he said, yeah, I'd, I'd love to. So I said, well, there's one quite impressive one I know called. Um, I've forgotten the name, but anyway, it involves the. Powder, a mixture of aluminium and magnesium oxides, and um, they're okay. used for um, welding tram lines together. Very, very hot if you ignite it, and it melts melts the tram lines. So I set up a tripod and a gauze, and I got a ceramic um, dish thing, which held maybe two ounces of this uh, powder. I filled it perhaps a little more than I should have done, and put a strip of magnesium ribbon in it to ignite it. And it, everything at first went impeccably. The magnesium ribbon, I said, stand by. And back in those days, this was the 60s, no one wore safety goggles or any of this. So I lit the ribbon and it burned down to the powder, which instantly caught fire. And it first of all was red and smoky, and then it turned incandescent white and blue as it got hotter and hotter and hotter. But then what I didn't anticipate happening was that uh, it would actually melt the ceramic, which never normally happens because it was so hot, and then melt its way through the gauze, which never normally happens. So this great clod of molten sort of material looking like a, a meteorite, small, dropped onto the brand new teak um, surface, burned through that, hit the floor, burned through that. We rushed down from the chemistry lab to the physics lab underneath and looked at the ceiling, rather like that scene in Alien where it comes through, drops to the floor, and then went to the next floor down. It burned its way through two and a half floors of brand new, and, and, and the chemistry master, a chap called Barris, was equally incandescent with rage and instantly reported it to the headmaster, a man called Ian Hamilton who summoned me and he said, oh, just, uh, I know you're head of school and you know, all the rest of it and going up to Oxford and all the way ground. You caused about 50,000 pounds worth of damage. And um, I think possibly it would be a rather good idea if you left school like um, tonight and just <laughs> didn't come back. And he similarly left school and went off and bred greyhounds for the rest of his life. So two, li two careers were change rather dramatically but why do you bring this up because it's a great story <laughs> see a wonderful way to, to start our discussion of Indeed. a book about knowledge well you said in the green room so i have some zingers and oh, I, that was if it. i had known that was it okay all right well that's that's a big one <laughs> what comes through in your works at least to me is um just a, a sense of natural curiosity you bring the reader along with you on your journeys of discovery of certain topics and so many different topics you're You've authored, what, 30 plus books? I think so. And like from, from topics like, you know, um, dictionaries to precision engineering to geology. So what is it in your life experience that, um, that, that creates that time where you, you have a, a curiosity about a subject? What is that, that moment that clicks and says, oh, this is the one I want to write a book about? Well, that is very interesting. I, uh, I mean, the curiosity thing, I think, probably began as a result of my father's insistence on always in the car and on any journey we took 
always having general knowledge books and quizzing me and giving me encyclopedias for presents and things. And uh, I mean, it sounds awfully nerdy, but I mean, I sort of played sports and things not particularly well. But he certainly inculcated a, a desire to, to know things, to amass, I mean, if you might call it trivia, but nonetheless, there was a, a lot going on. But then sort of refining that and deciding what, what makes a book that's a whole different subject. I mean, if I can give you an example, I know you really want to talk about this new book, but once I'd finished this this study of the transmission of knowledge, I was casting around for a, a new idea, and I thought what would be interesting would be to maybe I'd seen something on the interesting, but we don't know enough about it. Maybe we could know a lot more about it, and it could be a book. And this was... I came up with the title, which I thought was good. We call it The Breath of the Gods, right? A Natural History of the Wind. And I thought, that sounds a nice idea, because I then got a book by a man who wrote a scientific book about wind, and saw that there were, I think, 454 named regional winds, like you know the Zephyr and the Sirocco and the Santa Ana and the Mistral and the Fone and the you know, all this, that, and the other the Bora in Trieste. And I thought, well, this would be a lovely book to do, um, not least because it would give me the opportunity to go to lots of places that I haven't been before. <laughs> and um, so my editor, not unreasonably at first, thought, I wrote a proposal because, you know, we have to write proposals for books. And she thought <coughs> it was a very small subject compared to knowledge. So in a way, I felt I'd been hoist on my own petard by writing a big sort of sweeping book after which almost anything will look small. But I sort of convinced her in the end that actually wind was hugely important. It drove all the weather, it uh, was invisible. What was the phrase I used? Invisible, invincible, eternal, essential. So and that sort of tipped it over. So, so that's I, the next one that's we should expect for you? Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. 20, 2026, I think. Okay. Anyway. We'll, we'll meet, you'll be meet back. again. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. absolutely. Providing the wind is not too strong. On the <laughs> so let's let's uh, talk more about the the new book. Um, you introduced the concept of of knowledge and learning, um, and at the beginning you talk about how humans learn, even before they're conscious of how they learn. Um, can you tell a little bit about how you introduced that in the book and um, where, why you decided to start with that? particular story and, and concept of, of the acquisition of knowledge as a human. Yes, I mean, I suppose, well, I'm not I suppose, I, I, I realize that we initially, when we're very small people, we, um, we learn empirically. We, we touch a hot stove and we realize that's heat and we don't, don't want to do that. And, um, so in my particular case, it was uh, the first thing I remember in my life. I was... Um, I remember it so vividly. It was August, or July, August, 1947. So I was just coming up to three. And um, my mother had taken me shopping. I was big enough now not to be sitting in the pram, but sitting on the edge of the pram, the perambulator. And um, my father was away in Palestine, because he was a soldier, and it was in those days still Palestine. <laughs> So my mother and I, and we, it was a hot summer's day, hot for England anyway, and um, she made me leave my boots on the steps of the house and sort of dangle my little legs over there. It's a ridiculous considering. Very vivid um, memory. I was going to, well, I remember <laughs> it very well. So she took me shopping and I remember the shops we went to and then turned around and went back down the hill and we got to the house and she said, jump down. So I jumped down and put on your boots. I put on my left boot and instantly withdrew it because I was stung by something in the boot which flew out immediately. And my mother cried out, wasp, and I convulsed with floods of tears or something. And in that instant, I knew either because I'd experienced it or because she told me about it, um, what had happened. I knew it was a wasp rather than a bee because she said, had it been a bee, as you will well know as a keeper, um, the bee will die, where the wasp lives to do it again, which sort of prompts the question of what is the point of wasps? But anyway, uh, <laughs> but there is a point, as this book points out. Um, and I knew 
that ice and calamine lotion would uh, assuage the pain and that I knew about swelling and I knew about um, sympathy and I knew about um, getting lots of sympathy by crying really hard and getting bigger pieces of cake and things. But the most important thing I think I remember learning from this empirically gained piece of knowledge was the difference between left and right. Because up to that point, I had, like most people, I had no idea. I mean, the only way you can tell left from right, I suppose, is to face the North Star and you know that your the sun sets where the left hand is and the rises where the right hand is, of course, in the Northern Hemisphere. But um, now I knew that where I'd been stung was my left side. And uh, I think, not that I get terribly confused these days about left and right, maybe I will in another few years, but um, I now know that's the wasp side. I turn to the left to get to the library here. Yeah. So um, that story seemed to, what I wanted not to do in this book is to make it a, a book which has the word epistemology in it many times, because epistemology seems an unnecessarily ugly word, even though it you know, comes from the Greek for knowledge. But I didn't want this to be a technical and um, academic book. I wanted it to be very, very human. So I then look at curiosity and things like that. And often, not too often, because this isn't an autobiography, try and relate it to experiences I have. But try, as I say, if not to be too theoretical. You have to be a bit, because you have to talk about Plato and Socrates and Aristotle. But don't overdo it. I don't think you've overdone it. Well. I think it's a good balance. And, and it's not just about the acquisition of knowledge, right? It's the transmission and diffusion and sharing of knowledge. Yeah. And I think that then still plays um, against that idea that kept coming back to me as I was reading of curiosity. And being that as a driver of knowledge or the acquisition of knowledge, obviously hand in hand with the survival skills that are needed or the um, integration of you know being in society and, and needing knowledge for that. But today, it seems to me too that, that sometimes curiosity is stifled, right? Or it's discouraged, um, or it's tried to be managed more than um, supported and encouraged. And I'm thinking now, you know, now that we have all these machines and tools that do um, help us with the more basic and rote computational tasks, you know, can we have different approaches to education and to the exploration of knowledge? And I think maybe you've made some suggestions of thinking about, you know, those Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, the way that they approached thinking and knowledge. Are we perhaps um, going towards somewhere where we can uh, put learning and knowledge um, really in its own, uh, pursuing it for its own sake rather than for just being able to compute something or figure something out? Well, it's, it's a very, very broad, broad and interesting question. But what, if I can sort of turn this on its head, an awful lot of devices have been created in recent times which purportedly help us with the tasks that afflict our brains. The first of these ta uh, devices was the electronic calculator, which was invented in 1967 by Texas Instruments. It's called the Caltech 2500. It fitted into your shirt pocket. It cost $400. And the wonderful thing about it was that whereas the abacus and the slide rule and the mechanical calculators, you had to have some sort of basic, basic arithmetical sort of know-how in your brain in order to work them. But with this, all you did was touch buttons and magically, literally magically, you have no idea what's going on inside it. The answer, and invariably the right answer, if you would put the right figures in, would pop up on the screen. So in an instant, you could put all the part of your brain that dealt with computation into cold storage, as it were. And then as the years went on, you no longer needed to know how to spell or to use correct grammar because there were machines that were there to help you and correct you if you were wrong. And then of course came things like GPS. I mean, a case the other day where I was having lunch in Washington DC and a guest at the lunch drove in from across the other side of the Potomac and she used, as we all do these days, GPS to get her to the right, roughly to the right street. But she then got out of her car to find the restaurant and realized that she 
had lost her sense of direction. That somehow the knowledge that you know, it's noon and the sun is there, so if you walk towards it, that must be south. That had gone completely from her mind. So um, these devices, have, they've helped us. But I often wonder whether they've, in the same way, I don't know if many of you saw that film, wall -E. you remember that? Where the planet has been abandoned because it's so polluted and humankind lives in sort of suborbital spacecraft with all the people now enormously bloated, overweight, unfit, in Lazy Boys, uh, being fed sort of liquid proteins and watching softcore porn and <laughs> advertisements on flat screen televisions because, in part, of the labor-saving advices since you know, Mr. Otis and his elevator and Mr. Hoover and his uh, cleaner and electric toothbrushes and things, might the same thing be happening to our brains? We just no longer have to think about things, no longer have to know things, because Google will, and now sort of chat GPT, will provide us all the answers. So, but I sort of have a slightly more optimistic, maybe naive, Pollyanna-ish view that I think the cleverest among us today are probably no, in qualitative terms, no more or no, no less clever than Socrates and Plato and, uh, and Aristotle or you know, Herodotus and uh, Pythagoras and Euclid, the big six, if you like. Um, so if you compare their brain power to Bertrand Russell and Hannah Arendt and Richard Feynman, people like that, if you could somehow measure their actual brain power, I should think it was no greater than our modern colleagues. But the big difference was that they had so much less to know. I mean, they didn't have to know any other language other than Greek. Aristotle went to Egypt, but I don't know what he learned there, what he felt he had to know. It was a Greek colony, after all. Probably everyone spoke Greek. Um, they didn't have much history to know because there was little history, at least little written history. They didn't have to know a great deal of geography. And, you know, their, their minds weren't occupied with all the myriad things that our minds today are occupied. You know, the capital of South Dakota or the atomic weight of sodium or the members, you know, the principal figures in the Enlightenment. So I wonder sometimes if they, they were able to think the profound thoughts that they did, Socrates about ethics and Plato about defining what knowledge is and Aristotle on you know, happiness and stuff like that. Um, whether if we were to purge our brains of all this extraneous knowledge, because with no disrespect to the fine people of Pierre, South Dakota, there's no real need for many people to actually know the name of the capital of South Dakota. It's useful in a sort of quiz game or something, but you actually have to know it. Um, if we didn't know, if our minds were each a tabula rasa in the way that theirs were, because there was so little to know, I know this is a rather convoluted argument, um, then maybe it's possible if our brains were, as it were, held under a faucet and cleansed of all the sticky, unnecessary information, that the wise people in our society could, we could see a 21st century Plato who could think truly profound thoughts. Um, no idea what they might be, because I'm not clever enough to realize. But so I'm not totally pessimistic. In, I don't think, in other words, our brains are going to go the way of our bodies, not of the bodies of anyone in this room, of course, but you go to a shopping mall in Dubuque, and I think you'll see what I mean. Yes, <laughs> yes. And I have lived in Iowa, so I do know right. what you're talking about. Um, no disrespect to Iowans. Why not? Um, but I think that that ray of hope for me was um, was a, a nice thing to, to find in the book, because particularly now with discussions of artificial intelligence and you know some of those new technologies that are coming up where it does seem that there is the possibility for humans to, to, to become more of in that Wally world than, than where we are now, um, that, you know, that's, that's a scary prospect for people. And yet we rely on these technology, on the technology and the tools to do that for us. So I think, you know, finding that balance between AI and, um, you know, our daily lives of what does it mean for us then to be human? What is human? And what about knowledge um, creates the humanity between us? So, um, you know, I think there was that hopeful note that, that you also infuse in this. So I thank you for that.
I think one of the things that really resonated with me in this as well is the notion of knowledge as a commodity, which I mentioned briefly, but <clears throat> and the way that we store knowledge and share knowledge. And so you do a great deal about books and about and libraries and, libraries, and even to my librarian friends, because I see at least one of them, cataloging and classification systems. I feel seen. Thank you. <laughs> and, and you even talked about one that I hadn't heard of before, so I felt really that was pretty awesome. Um, but, you know, if you could talk a little bit too about, you know, do you think that, that knowledge as a commodity has, has lessened in value now that it is so easy to find information or things like libraries and books and even like podcasts or oral, oral histories, museums, wherever we, we store and share knowledge? Are they still as valuable as they were pre-technical times, or is it just a, a kind of a different kind of value? Well, I, I, in, in my answer here, I want to bring back our friend the wasp, because he's sort of, I said, what is the point of wasps, which is not entirely facetious. A word, incidentally, that one of the only two words in the English language that has all the vowels in the right order. Facetious, and maybe anyone can think of the other one, but not shut it out. <laughs> There'll be a small prize. You can give away the ARC. But no, the, the wasp, there's this Chinese chap called Kai Lun who was afflicted by wasps. I mean, there were a lot in the part of China he was living in. And he noticed these nests and that they had made of this gray substance which often fell to the ground. And one day, according to the story, um, he I wonder whether my calligraphy brush can impress a character on this substance. And he found it could and would. And he thought, well, maybe if I can find out what the wasp does to produce the material that makes its very elaborate nests. So he followed wasps for several weeks and months and saw that they picked up little bits of wood and masticated them and spat them out. It's like this sort of porridge. And then tamped them down with their little feet and made this lightweight, gray, nearly transparent substance. And um, maybe we can do the same. And so he did on a larger scale, laying it out to dry in the sunshine, having made you know, bits of cloth and bits of wood pulp and stuff. And he made effectively the first paper. So Chinese made the first paper, and then the Chinese also we, of course, tend to think that printing with movable type was either Gutenberg in Europe or Caxton in Britain. Um, but it wasn't. It was the Chinese, 897 AD, 600 years before Gutenberg. They used movable type to print on paper a derivative of the substance that Kai Lun had produced, having seen the wasps at work. And the first document, which is called the Diamond Sutra, which you can see in the British Museum in London, um, was deliberately for free distribution. That changed, however, in the, 16th, in the 15th century, when Gutenberg said to, you know, we've created these elaborate machines, and you know, we have to have armies of people to produce the Bibles or the various tracts and things that they made from the big press in Mainz, we'll have to charge money. And so all of a sudden, what had been free and dis you know, distributed in theory, to thousands of people, because once you've got the mat, you can produce the same thing over and over again. But now we'll have to do it for money. And that, so it commodified initially religious writings and then all sorts of writings, and then the first newspaper was created. And there was very little altruism about it. There was a degree, I mean, the first newspaper in New York City was to produce information, just the arrival and departure of ships and so forth. But soon, it became a commodity for the distribution of news and people, I, mean, I don't need to tell you this, but you know it very well, the better the news, the sexier the news, the more graphic the news and all the rest of it, the more copies of the paper you would sell and great fortunes could be made. And so the commodification of knowledge, which happened almost coincident with Gutenberg's invention of, uh, <coughs> European invention of printing, is in, in, the beginning of the, the path to the manipulation, not the distortion and fake news and all of those. So, they, so it's um, not in, not an altogether good good development. I mean, let me just say a brief word on 
on fake news. You know, we blame it all on Tucker Carlson and Rupert Murdoch and so forth. But in fact, one of the classic examples that had a really s severe effect was in, in Britain, in my, my country, in 1924, when um, we had a socialist prime minister, the first ever socialist prime minister, a chap called Ramsay MacDonald, who was elected. And the, you know, the outrage among the, the people, the Conservative Party, effectively, the Tories, that had for years run Britain was profound. And they said, that this rapscallion must be removed from Downing Street as soon as possible. Mercifully, he had a, mercifully, from their point of view, he had a small majority in Parliament. They were able to um, press a vote of no confidence, and indeed he, he lost, and he had to go back to, for a new election. During the election campaign, which in Britain lasts only three weeks to the great relief, I mean, you'd love that instead of the kind of thing that's going on now. Um, on the Saturday before the Tuesday election, a letter was received by the headquarters of the Labour Party in Britain from Moscow, from a man called Zinoviev, who was the Secretary General of Comintern, the international sort of evangelical communist organization, saying, comrades in London, if you do us in Moscow the honor of re-electing uh, Ramsay MacDonald to Downing Street, then we promise we will do our level best to help you turn Britain into Bolshevik society. We will abolish the monarchy. We will completely reorganize the armed forces. We will get rid of the aristocracy. It'll be a worker's paradise. And this letter was in instantly leaked to the Daily Mail, which then, as now, is a pretty, pretty harsh, horrendous um, right-wing newspaper. Saturday morning paper, a 10-decker headline, Britain to be turned into a worker's paradise. You know, King will be put in prison or whatever if you re-elect Ramsay MacDonald. And obviously what happened was that there was an enormous reaction against Ramsay MacDonald. He lost by the biggest, one of the biggest majorities in modern British history. And um, he was replaced by, by Stanley Baldwin, a you know, genial pipe-smoking Tweedy Tory. The Zinoviev letter that triggered all this was, of course, a forgery. It didn't come from Moscow at all. It was engineered by MI5 and given to the Daily Mail, who knew it was a forgery, knew it was fake news, but the publication of it in a commodified news journal, successor to Gutenberg's printing technology, uh, caused the f total failure of a collapse of a British government. So fake news can be very, very much more important than anything that uh, Tucker Carlson might give us. Wow, I hadn't realized that our... our uh media had such uh, such examples to follow, hundred, hundred so they were ago, using yep. the same playbook. Yep. Um, but, but that leads to, too, something else that I thought about this, and as I think about artificial intelligence and, uh, and other things, um, you know, especially when AI is looking at like, the full realm of information that's out there, but not necessarily being able to distinguish very, uh, um, very adroitly what is real and true, and what is being, um, you know, supplied by bad actors or people that want to contribute to that? So this idea of veracity and sources, I think we're really, we're really losing that ability to vet our sources or to understand the underlying source of information and knowledge as it's being so quickly transmitted and reappropriated and, and, you know, uh, restated in, in so many different ways. And I think. You know that really does present a challenge for us going forward and how we think about knowledge and what we can trust. Well, um, let me give you an example of that. I, I'd now trust Wikipedia. I used not to when Jimmy Wales invented it, wherever we last in the end of the 90s. But it, it had a shaky beginning. But now, I like it. I mean, I use it a lot. I mean, it lists thousands of sources for nearly all everything it says. But on um, this particular day, I remember it vividly, it was the 10th of March last year, and I was well into writing, I mean, it was getting towards the end of the book, and I was writing about um, the invention of hypertext, and it was um, invented, you know, the hypertext when the text is in a different color and you click on it and it enables you to go hither and yon, one of the sort of seminal, one of the central aspects of, um, of any sort of text base internet usage and 
that was invented and demonstrated in what was called the mother of all demos in San Francisco in the late 1960s by a man called Doug Engelbart. And um, I, so I said that Engelbart demonstrated it and a lot of computer scientists says, wow, you know, this is going to open the door to all sorts of possibilities. So I thought, well, I bet to know something about Doug Engelbart. So I went to Wikipedia and I looked him up and it, I wanted to know when he was born, where he was educated and so forth. And it said, you know, born such and such, educated such and such. But then it said, and he died on the 10th of March, 2022, the very date that I'm writing about him, which sent I mean, a chill down my spine. You think, my God, did I somehow trigger his <laughs> demise? This is awful. So, like the burning of the cafe in New Orleans. Well, uh, yeah, we, that was something that, that <laughs> pe people here will not know about, but, uh, but we talked about it in the green room, about a cafe that turned me away. And so maybe you do have superpowers. Well, maybe. But so I, I thought this is very odd. So I, the, but there were no obituaries. You know, this is a man of huge importance, at least in the computer world. So I looked at the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and Wired Magazine and other technical, no, no mention of his passing. So before I went to bed that night, I, um, I said, I'm so sorry to hear that Doug Engelbart has died and you know, this hugely important person. Um, why no obituaries, went to bed, went to sleep. When I woke up in the morning, there was a, a long uh, email from a chap in New Zealand who said, oh, hello, my name is such and such, and I'm a Wikipedia editor. And I want you to know that uh, Doug Engelbart is alive and well. But last, or yesterday, a hacker in Australia killed 10 people at random. Wow. An ostrich farmer in South Africa, a baseball player in Japan, uh, head of a softball league in Minnesota, Doug Engelbart. But they're all well and fine. <laughs> but I here, sitting in New Zealand, have returned them to life. And it's a wonderful <laughs> feeling to be able to sort of Re resurrect people, which he had duly done. So I was able both, both to correct it, but also to put in a note saying, trust Wikipedia, but be, be skeptical. But the other thing, I mean, and I dare say, I hope we'll be able to discuss this a bit more, um, the whole business about um, ChatGPT, because the book, the, the closing chapters, or the closing chapter really, when I look at wisdom and things like that, um, I, the whole open AI had, I think it was November that um, they got going. And so I was able to look at chat GPT 3.0 and then 3.5. And, um, but by now the book was very nearing production. I think it was February and I wanted it, clearly it had to be in the book, but it was, things were changing so rapidly. So one of the things we got chat, I got it to do two things. One, to take a paragraph of mine and give it the first sentence of my paragraph and then said, write it as you would write it in my voice and we'll use that as an illustration so that that would be my paragraph and then in a box making it clear that it was there's, there's and when it came in about 15 minutes later, I mean, I slog over these things for days, 15 minutes later came in my paragraph, which I don't know, 300 words or something, beginning with the sentence that I had written, and then the rest of it was stuff that it had written. My editor, Sarah Nelson, said, it's pretty good. It, it does, it, it sounds <laughs> like it, your voice. It's pretty, pretty, <laughs> she said, you know, your next book, well, I'm not sure. <laughs> next Wind. book, one, forget it. But the other thing was I got it to, um, to look at my favorite poem, Ozymandias by Shelley, which most people, most people in Britain know, um, you know, I met a traveler from an antique land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert near them. And I gave it those two lines and asked it to complete the sonnet in the voice of it rather than Shelley. And what it produced was beautiful. It did not, of course, include the line, and on the pedestal these words remain, my name is Ozymandias, king of kings, look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. But it came up with other material, which was really beautiful, except it had one strange grammatical error. He said, I looked up at the sea. And you can't look up at the sea. You can only look down at the sea or look at, across at the sea. 
and the people at OpenAI, yes, they admitted it had failed in this respect, to produce something beautiful but essentially meaningless. Um, but they said, don't worry, chat. GPT 4.0 will make sure that It'll that kind it. of mistake will <laughs> never be made again. Yeah. And I don't know, I dare say many of you will have read the Tom Friedman column about, no, about six weeks ago, I think, having had chat GPT 4.0 demonstrated to him. And I have to confess I'm not an enormous fan of Tom Friedman. I often think that if, um, if, if bloviating was an Olympic sport, he would win gold year after year. <laughs> But I hope he's not looking. I hope he's not watching. No, well, I, mean, I should say it with great respect, Mr. Friedman. Um, but that particular column was amazing, and he was astonished by the abilities, and that threatens yes. all of us, I think, in this room. Yeah. So, you mentioned the, you know the uh, latter part of the book talks about knowledge and wisdom, and uh, can you talk a little bit about where they intersect um, and how they come together, or they don't? Yeah, that's, uh, I'm utterly fascinated by it. The whole question of polymaths, I mean, are there such things as polymaths still, people that know sort of everything? My heroes, you know, like James Murray, the editor of the OED, just knew everything so much. Um, I, there seem to be fewer and fewer because education is often more about training than education. If I can just go back a little bit sure. about, I looked at, examinations in schools and I look at teaching methods and so forth around the world and um, I look at the SAT here and um, I know it's not as favored as it used to be um, but then I look at the the Chinese equivalent um, which is nearly all essay based it's called the Gaokao and it's held about now actually in early June all over the country so millions upon millions of children will be taking the Gaokao and how their performance in it will mark the rest of their lives effectively. So I got a Gaokao paper from 2022 and looked at questions, essay questions. And um, I thought, um, I just, if I can remember it, give you one example of an essay question set last year. Containers for milk are always square. Bottles for mineral water are usually round. Wine bottles are usually round, but put into square boxes. Write an essay on the subtle philosophy of the round and the square. And I thought, magic. Any 17-year-old that can write a coherent essay about that deserves to do well in life. And, uh, <laughs> but I, I, I hope I haven't lost the thread totally. But oh, I was talking about polymaths, people that know a great deal and therefore are educated, have the ability to write essays. I might say that when I went up to Oxford, even though I went up to read geology, um, I took similar sort of exam-based question. I remember vividly, it was staged in the dining hall at Pembroke College, Oxford, sitting under an enormous oil portrait of uh, an alumnus of Pembroke College, which was Samuel Johnson. Pretty and intimidating to have him looking down at you. There were just two of us, a chap called C.R.S. Talbot and me. And at nine o'clock, the college uh, bell chimed and the invigilator said, gentlemen, turn over your papers and you'll have three hours. And there were five questions, choose any two and write an essay. So I remember to this day, my two were, two cheers for democracy, is two the right number? Seems a very good question for a 17 year old. And the other one was an ironic, considering where I've chosen to live. Is the American way of life truly exportable? Which is a wonderful subject to think about. Um, and I wonder today whether, I mean, I'd love to see the essay brought back. And, and so some, the, the power of thinking seems to be, at least in many Western education systems today, uh, somewhat diminished in favor of remembering or knowing or I don't know it's 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 a complex subject but then you move on to the whole business of wisdom which used to be put it crudely a lot of knowledge multiplied by a lot of experience which is why older people tended to be thought of as 
being being wise. But nowadays people challenge that and say that actually it is possible that wisdom can be taught. And there is this part of the University of Chicago called the Center for Practical Wisdom, where it suggests you can be trained to be wise. But then that you know, prompts the question, well, what is wisdom? And it's sort of doing the right thing. It's sort of ultra common sense, really, putting aside all extraneous material and saying, no, take a deep breath, and this is actually the right thing to do. It's a th difficult thing to define. But I urge you to, if you're interested in this subject, to go to the, the website of the Center for Practical Wisdom, and they, they thought about it a great deal. Well, we need wise people in society. And I'm just afraid that uh, there aren't many. Particularly, I have to say, and I say this as an American, so I'm not some windy, pompous Englishman telling people here how to behave. I just think I wish there was more wisdom in the in the White House, for instance. Certainly, the White House of three years ago, <laughs> there wasn't a great deal of wisdom. I don't think. Maybe these days, a little more. Um, one more question and then um, obviously talk about anything that I haven't asked you that you would like to mention and then perhaps some uh, time for questions. Um, access and equity is something I think about a lot. Uh, you know, as a public librarian, um, making sure that anybody who wants access to information has the ability to do so is a challenge, particularly in cities like Hartford and across the country um, and, and all, really all over the world that doesn't, that don't always have reliable, consistent access to the technology that enables people to kind of, um, you know, uh, take advantage of the, the commodity of knowledge and the form that it takes right now. So as we think about the future of knowledge and education and, and acquiring that and, and making it accessible, um, you know, how do we ensure that disenfranchised mod and marginalized people continue to have that ability? I mean, you, you start off the book talking about your experience or the experience of a, a a teacher in India, right? And so how do we make sure that we're not developing systems as a, as a human race that just automatically disenfranchise people and, and keep them from being able to um, gain the knowledge that they need to be successful and that we need to be successful as a, as a human race? Well, I, I must say, I'm, I'm glad you've opened the door to my talking about this India situation because it's a wonderful story. When I was a foreign correspondent covering the this, the war between Pakistan and uh, India that led to the founding of Bangladesh in 1971. The 10 or so of us who the foreign correspondents going to the battlefield every day would come back to the Grand Hotel in Charingi in Calcutta. There we were, you know, that's where we've telexed our stories back to London or New York or wherever our headquarters were, and um, you know, relaxed, had dinner, shower, all the rest of it. And there was the, in the reception area of this grand old hotel, was this extraordinarily intelligent, nice, charming young woman called Shukla Bose. She was actually in those days called Shukla Chakravati. And um, she just was a sort of den mother to us all. She looked after us and we all loved her dearly. Then I came back to live and work in India and kept in touch with Shukla over the years. And she married a man called Mr. Bose, who became Shukla Bose and had a daughter, and I became the little girl's godfather and uh, kept in touch with her. She went on to Cambridge, and she a very bright woman. And Shukla climbed up the greasy pole of um, Indian corporate life until 2003, when she decided, having won the Mrs. Gandhi Award for the, most, you know, the best Indian businesswoman of the year or something, that she wanted to give it all up because central, her belief was that the disenfranchised, the poorest children, she lives in Bangalore in South India, where there are 800 registered slums with 2 million people living so far below, <coughs> below the poverty line, it's barely possible to conceive of their straitened circumstances. The fathers have long abandoned them, the mothers live in sort of cardboard boxes and things with these little children who know a modicum of English because they pick it up one way or another. And Shukla said, they should be educated. And I am going to, because I have a bit of money and I can wheedle some out of the corporate offices, the particularly a lot of American companies based in Bangalore. Um, let's start to school them because they won't get any education 
relevant to the present situation. So she, won, she got a couple of colleague ladies to, who had some teaching experience. She acquired what's called a basati, which is a sort of hut on top of the flat roof of a building, and put in some desks and things, and got a seamstress and to put together some uniforms, and put a trestle table up in one of these appalling slums, and made it known that any child that wanted education, she would provide it free of charge. I'll give you three meals a day. I'll give you school uniforms and as much education in the English language as you can possibly want. And children initially, their mothers, you know, this is, you can't go, but she got a by the end of the first week, she got 11 children, including a little girl who came at the close of day when Shukla was packing away her table. This little girl came running barefoot and said, my name is Jennifer and I want to be a doctor. And um, Shukla set up the school and with 11 children and two teachers. And that was in 2003. Well, she now has 4,000 children and not a penny piece is, they don't cost anything to have these educations. There's been furious opposition by the old timers in Bangalore because the two languages, Canada and Malayalam, Malayalam incidentally the only palindromic named language in the world, I think, M-A-L-A-Y-A-L-A-M. Um, they said they should be taught in vernacular languages, not the language of the colonial oppressor, but Shukla said to him that. And the first graduating class was in, whatever it was, 2017 or something, six of the children went to Duke University in this country, and their lives have been utterly transformed. Jennifer is a doctor. Oh, that's so yes, I mean, distributing knowledge freely using whatever means possible, in this case, little primitive schools. And anyone, so many friends of mine who have gone to India and said, I want to go down and see it. And Shukla says, well, volunteer, for God's sake, please just, we'll give you accommodation. Just teach, the, be with them, tell them about your life in America. And they do, and they all benefit. So um, in my view, Shukla Bose is a name that, I mean, she's getting on in years, as we all are, but I want to see her get recognized. And this book is, will help, I hope. All right, do we have time for questions, Omar? Yeah. I have time for a couple questions. Just, uh, just wait for the mic to get to you mic because we want people online to be able to hear your question. There was. Certainly. The proctor. That's the general idea, yes. <laughs> the majority. I Yes, well, deep depression, basically, by <laughs> hearing what you have to say. I might say, parenthetically, that when I, I became, I read geology at Oxford, and then I became a geologist and went off to East Africa, to Uganda specifically, to be one. And then, to cut a very long story short, I read a book by a man called James Morris about how he was a foreign correspondent that got to the summit of Mount Everest and reported the news of the success of the expedition back to the London Times in time for it to be published in the Times on the morning of the Queen's coronation on the 2nd of June 1953. And this story, reading it by my campfire in a village called Kayanjojo in Western Uganda, was a Pauline conversion for me. I said, I don't want to 
anymore go around the world with a hammer and a bottle of hydrochloric acid and a compass. I wanted to go around the world with a notebook and pencil and tell stories. So I wrote on one of those, remember those airmail letter forms that you could never, a letter to this person I'd never heard of before, James Morris, and uh, saying I'm a 21-year-old geologist living in East Africa and I've just read Coronation Everest, your book. Can I be you? Effectively. And back three or four weeks later came a beautifully typewritten letter on dove gray writing paper with his address and scarlet ink at the top saying effectively, by all means, I mean, all you have to do is leave Africa, come back to England and work on a local newspaper and write to me again. So that began a train of, of um, events that led ultimately to me becoming a, geo a, a, a journalist and James eventually becoming a woman because James in 1974 became Jan Morris Jan and I were enormous best friends for the rest of our lives. I, we wrote a book together about India. and She died only two years ago. Well, Sarah Wheeler, who is writing Jan's biography, rang me up the other day to say that my letter, written in cursive on that writing paper from Uganda, is in the Aberystwyth archives in North Wales. And she's found it and will use it in the book. And I said, this is profoundly embarrassing because it will sound so juvenile. She said, no, it's really rather charming. But you did say, I am a 21-year-old geologist. Can I be you? But she could read it, and that's the important thing. But um, I think, I mean, you presumably, you can't teach people now to handwrite, or can you? I mean, do you attempt to? Does the school allow you to? Is it too late? And yet, you, I mean, I, before I got on the stage here, I was looking at the latest and extremely good Twain exhibition. And there is his annotations of certain photographs of him in the white suit. And his handwriting is so beautiful. And I often think, as I dare say you do too, that if you take care with the way you transmit knowledge, it will... I mean, I, you know, Martin Amos died the other day, as you well know, and I didn't know him terribly well, but I knew him a bit. Christopher Hitchens was a very great friend. but. Martin Amos, if you look on Twitter or one of these things, there are a number of interviews with him about how he composes, constructs sentences and how every sentence, there's the lapidary attention he plays to it until it has a sort of euphony in his head. He knows the sentence is going to work. Similarly with writing, I think. But I'm afraid you and I think that, that train has left the station, I regret to say, but I do really regret it. Thank you for your question. I know you in the front wanted to ask. I'm so sorry. She beat you to it. I can talk loudly. Okay. Oh, really? We, but we need... Uh, sorry. <coughs> it's for the online audience. Daughter of a teacher. Um, I'm just wondering if you've started writing any books and gotten halfway through and said, oh my God, I'm so bored. I won't voice this on anybody and just stop the book. And by the way, we've loved your books. Well, we know, we know none of them belong to that category. Well, I must say, on Amazon, I mean, one always looks at Amazon. It brings you down a peg or two to look at the one-star reviews. <laughs> now, this book is the worst book I've ever read in my That's life. your competitors. <laughs> well, it could be. But there's one fellow who early on said, I've read Winchester's book to page 159, I'll never read any more of his books. I have no idea, I looked at page, there's nothing particularly contemptible on page 150. No, don't even look, I promise you, it's not <laughs> worth it. I think he's, but the answer to your question is yes, once I did a book on, Man I started a book on Manchuria, um, the cockpit of the East. I saw an awful lot of interesting things happened. And I just found, well, actually, in the two now I think about it, there's another book about mathematics. Um, but sticking to the Manchuria book, um, just as you said, I said, I am boring myself rigid. If I'm boring myself. And what was the other? Well, the other was about a man called Everest, um, second name. He was the founder of um, 
the basic story was he was a mathematician of extraordinary ability who was a, a Parisian revolutionary. And um, in the 1820s or 1830s, I think, and he was put into prison and executed. I think he was executed. But during that time, he scribbled about 80 pages of mathematical notes, which once he had been taken off to the guillotine or whatever, um, languished in obscurity, but was found maybe the 1860s by Gauss, the great German mathematician, and said this is just a, a new field of mathematics. Has been. He was called Evaliste Galois, that's right. And I thought I can write a book about Evaliste Galois. So I used to go to Boston once a week to meet a friend of mine who was a mathematician and taught it at Harvard. And he taught me the rudiments of um, this particular Evaliste Galois invention. But I just couldn't understand it. And I knew I, I, there was no way, if I didn't understand it, even though it had all the elements of romance and imprisonment and French Revolution and all this, it could have made a good book, but not, I was not competent to write it. So I stopped. So Manchuria and Galois are available to cleverer people than I to write. And we had one question from the uh, virtual audience. Um, Stephen Lake wanted to know, um, what kind of books do you like to read? What, what are you reading right now? Well, um, the, the, the book I took with me on the book tour was Graham Greene's The Human Factor, which I love because it was about espionage in, in London. It's got this sense of great melancholy and uh, it's very poignant and beautiful book. And of course it has racial overturns because the narrator is married, he, he is white and is married to a, a lady, a, a non-white lady. It's a, a beautiful, and his, his talking about Martin Amos's love for good sentences Graham Greene is brilliant, and there's this wonderful line in talking about they have a dog, a dog called Buller. They live in London, in uh, northwest London, and he's very concerned about the security of his wife because she's a black woman in London and there are race riots and things. And so they have this dog called Buller, and he just observed he was on the telephone and he noticed Buller licking his private parts with the gusto of an alderman drinking soup. <laughs> <laughs> It's just a wonderful, wonderful image. It's, you can't unsee that. <laughs> so that's what I'm reading now. But my favorite of all books is um, Life a User's Manual by, um, what's his name? Um, uh, huh. I've forgotten his name now. French, Ever no, not Everly Scalwell. Um, anyway, Life a User's Manual, look it up. It's published by Godin in Boston. It's 1984, written originally in French. Um, and is unbelievably clever book to be kept in the loo and read sort of 50 pages at a time. Um, that's, that is all the time uh, that we have. Thank you so much, Simon. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And thank you to Bridget uh, for moderating as well. Um, and if you're in the audience, in our in-person audience, the book uh, is available for sale in the store. Um, and if you are in our virtual audience, it's available online. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, Simon will be signing books outside of the store, um, which is, uh, like I said, now open. Uh, thank you, and have a great evening.